welcome to Access to Justice. I'm your host, Heather Malarick of Merrick Law, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Evan Clark of Kahane Law. Hey, Evan, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Heather. How are you? How's, uh, how's life going for you? I'm well, I'm well. Uh, as we record this, we're uh, just on the verge of Easter holidays, and mm. we're going to squeeze in one more ski trip, so I'm excited about that. Whoa, Hoping like, there'll be some snow left in the mountains. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what's the what are the conditions like this time of year? I mean, it's also, like, icy cold right now, which I find totally uncalled for in April. <laughs> so maybe that's good for the mountain, though. Yeah, it'll keep the snow, and uh, it's supposed to be six on Saturday. So you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm full. I'm hopeful. Right. How are you doing? You know, before we press record here, we were commenting on you've got like a lovely sort of Superman curl that's happening. I think today, I got it. So. I think I got it out of the way. But yeah, I, I said sometimes, sometimes I get a Superman curl, and there's nothing I can do about it. It just keeps on coming back. So Aww, yeah. it's tough. Yeah, <laughs> but it really like no, no because people would just assume that I meant to do that and like, oh yeah, look at this guy making a Superman curl. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of us, who, for those of you who are joining us by audio, you know, maybe this is an excuse to check out the <laughs> YouTube and look at Evan's uh, Superman curl today. <laughs> so. I love, I love the saying of like <laughs> making a, uh, an observation about someone that they have the face for radio. So maybe, maybe you don't want to come and look, but <laughs> up to you, I guess. <laughs> we are joined today by our very special guest, Kim McDonald, McDonald advisory. Kim's a financial advisor and insurance advisor at Raymond James. How are you today, Kim? Hi, Heather. Hi, Evan. Evan, I like your curls because Heather also has curls and I feel like our hosts should be, you know, it should be matchy matchy in some ways. Um, I'm doing pretty good. I got I got new elastics for my braces, so my face hurts and I hate braces so much. I'm just gonna continue to complain about my braces. I don't think adults should have to get braces. And I just like all listeners to know if you're offered, if you're told to get braces, I wasn't offered, I was told, don't don't do it. Find another way because they're the worst. <laughs> they are the worst. I I had them as an adult too, but I was like like, you know, barely an adult, but I used to, whenever I'd get them tightened, I would, for some reason, the thought of bashing my face into a brick, a ragged brick wall seemed like a pleasant idea. Like that would somehow be an improvement on the pain. Yeah. Oh, that sounds horrible. That's how painful it is. Hmm. Never had braces. I feel like our guest is smiling. I feel like he knows a little bit of, about this. <laughs> I, I did go through the, uh, go through the brace thing and then managed to get uh wisdom teeth grew in and partially wrecked them but uh yes. i haven't yet gone down the route my dentist said hey are you interested in Inv invisalign i said um and she said it's really great except for you have to wear a retainer when you sleep for the rest of your life and i'm like oh he uh did oh. So. I, I, yeah i mean that's what i think i was supposed to do after my braces it lasted two years and i was like this i'm <laughs> done with this yeah uh. And you know what? My teeth are fine. <laughs> are they as perfectly straight as the day I got my braces off? No, <laughs> but they're fine. They're a lot better than before I got braces. But they're manageable. Um, well, I'd like to formally introduce our guest today. We've got Rick Harcourt here with us today. Hi, Rick. How are you Hello. doing? Aside, how are your teeth today? <laughs> Good. They're pretty clean. Been flossing regularly. I've got a dental appointment in a few weeks, so it's kind of upped my game a little bit on that front. Excellent. <laughs> Rick is the president of Capital Estate Planning Corporation, where he leads a team that helps several hundred organizations look after several thousand employees across Alberta. Um, Capital Estate Planning also works with teachers and non-teaching staff at virtually every school board across Alberta to help them save for the future and address some of the biggest risks life can throw at you. So, Rick, you're here today to talk to us about risk, I think, generally. And I was thinking, you know, maybe we should call this episode Risky Business, but I don't know. Maybe that's, a, that's just a work in progress. So uh, welcome to the podcast. Glasses. Yeah. <laughs> it would be better if, as you said, that he like slid into the to the picture in his yeah. underwear. Yeah, yeah. tidy whities 
the martini or whatever drink it was. And yeah, I'll be editing that in later. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the intro. That's, that's some next level editing skills for Evan to practice, but <laughs> Well, it's really great to have you here, um, Rick. I'm, I know we're both looking forward, to, or all three of us are looking forward to pick your brain about this. So um, I guess the first question I have to ask you is in your prep notes, you said there's some connection between astronaut Chris Hadfield and insurance. Is that a good place to start? I'm very sure. Why not? It's a nice weird place anyways. So um, it's just because I tell it, this story when we do financial wellness presentations, we're talking about risk. So Chris Hatfield is one of the speakers that I've, I think I've seen him live three times. I, I feel like I, every day I could probably listen to Chris Hatfield and Ted Lasso and my day would be fairly complete. <laughs> um, but he had this story. So when Chris Hatfield was the commander of the International Space Station, he was woken up one day by a cosmonaut who woke him up to tell him that something was spewing out of the International Space Station. And it turned out to be their main coolant. Oh. And, and so, you know, that's kind of a big deal. So like, he, uh, you know, he got up, they went into action. They went, okay, what's going on? Pulled out the manual, said, if this happens, replace this part. Got their two most experienced spacewalkers. And they went out there, pulled out the old part, put in the new one, everyone was safe. And so really good news story. Now, what does that have to do with, you know, insurance and risk? Well, when they were going up to the space station, did they just kind of say, hey, if something goes wrong, we'll just kind of wing it? <laughs> we'll just figure that out at the time. No, they went mm -hmm. and said, okay, what are all the things that could possibly go wrong? What are the things that could have a powerful impact on us? And if one of those things happened, how would we deal with it? Now, people have the opportunity to do exactly the same thing, but in with their lives. So you have the opportunity to say, okay, what are the things that could really go wrong in our lives that could really derail us? And, you know, for Kim and I, we're financial professionals, what could really derail us professionally? Um, and if one of those happened, how would we deal with it? So mm -hmm. what if one of us got really sick? What if one of us died or couldn't work for some reason? Like, what are all those things that could really hit us hard? And if those happened, then how do we deal with those? And then, you know, we work with folks to say, okay, if this happens, how do we deal with it? Do we want it to be something we just wing and deal with ourselves or do we want to make it someone else's problem? Right. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, oh, I think <laughs> what you're saying is we should all have spare organs in case something goes wrong. Is yeah, that, pretty much. Is spare that the message I'm supposed to take away? Well, like, the if your body off. starts, if your body starts spewing coolant into the atmosphere, <laughs> Heather, you better have a spare. <laughs> that has hardly happened since university. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, the big thing that we look at is saying, okay, um, how do we plan for those bad things that can happen? And you know, on the financial side, it usually it's usually come down coming down to um, either with savings or with insurance. And you know, the savings part is just having that plan in place. The insurance part is making it someone else's problem, making an insurance company take care of that risk, because the risks are there whether you want to face it or not. I mean, that's just the reality of things, right? There are statistical examples that say that there is this chance of something really, really bad happening to you. Um, so you have the choice. You can say, um, okay, if this happens, uh, we'll just wait. If this happens, you know, if something happens to my wife, I'll hopefully someone will start a GoFundMe page and, and pray that people in my community will come up and feel sorry for me enough to support me. Right. Or, uh, she could just have insurance and then if something happens to her, then we'll have money to pay for our mortgage and help raise our kids. Um, right. I think that's a really intuitive thing you bring up about the GoFundMe pages, because probably all insurance advisors, when they see those, they're thinking the, the exact same thing. Um, when those, those pages go up, tell us a little bit about 
how you could transfer that risk to somebody so you don't have to have a GoFundMe page. Sure. And I've got to say, like Kim, I, and maybe I just have a different emotional reaction than to you because you're actually smiling, but those put me into like Hulk mode. <laughs> like, honestly, like every time I see one of those, I'm like, the guy was 25. He could have paid 10 bucks a month and have all his bills taken care of. Right. Before he got hit by that tractor trailer. Like, like, seriously, how are you not taking care of your family? So I, I tend to get mad at that guy I never even met. Just oh, because 100%. having been through it, I know it's it's such an easy thing if people just take the time to do it. Hmm. Right. And so how do you do that? It's um it, it and it depends on the risk. Uh, right. So um, there are different risks that we can face in life, but the guy getting hit by a tractor trailer or the death one. So that one, you know, very low incident happens to very few people, especially when you're younger, but huge impact. Right. How do you take care of it? Life insurance. And, you know, at the simple end of things, something that's just guaranteed for a short period of time, that's relatively actually very inexpensive, especially when you're young. Um, you know, and get that in there that says, hey, if I get hit by that tractor trailer, it's going to, you know, pay off my mortgage, support my kids while they're growing up. Right. So um, hmm, it strikes me that younger people sometimes like they're well positioned to get this insurance and get it for cheap, but they don't. <laughs> They haven't lived enough life maybe sometimes to appreciate <laughs> that they need it. And then I know when it came time for me to be getting this kind of insurance, I've lived a little bit more life and stuff starts popping up and you need to fill out that questionnaire with all of the medical history and all of those things. So um, can you talk a little bit about that process, I guess? I think it's called the underwriting process. Is it different when you're younger? Can you just do it when you're 25? And keep the same insurance till you're 80 and yeah you've got different so you're always going to have to answer medical questions um you and your insurance advisor are going to get to know each other very well or at least they're going to get to know you very well um you know because there are a bunch of questions about your medical history and things like that there are options too sometimes when they sign up where they'll have just a third party person so the random person from the insurance company on the phone learns all about your medical history instead of your advisor. That's an option too. Um, but basically, you know, you go through, you fill out an application that asks mostly about health history. Uh, then it goes to, into underwriters and underwriters try to find reasons why you may be a greater than average risk. So where, you know, because of it's usually health. So health history, if you smoke or not, um, then don't smoke. I mean, basically from an insurance perspective, mm. they charge a lot more for smokers because they're a lot more likely to die. Right. Um, and then, you know, also some lifestyle things. If you're an, you know, amateur bullfighter, they would probably treat your risk differently than if you're an amateur yoga practitioner. What if you're a professional bullfighter? If you're a professional bullfighter, then you will probably have an exclusion from bullfighting uh, as your uh, as your method of death, for example, or they might put a an adjusted risk, so a higher cost for you on that. Right. You'd probably be looking at specialty insurance if you're a professional bullfighter based on your occupation. Okay. We don't. I don't think we have. So any it's a really boring Canada. answer to a pretty funny question. I don't think we have any of those in Canada, though. So. <laughs> But um, yeah, so basically it goes through underwriting and then they come back and say, yes, we think this person is, you know, kind of average on the broad risk scale and granted or might have a different cost or something like that. Kim, what, about, what about the family members? If, if you're related to somebody who's got a, a big problem. Yeah, so. It depends on the insurance company. What we tend to see is, uh, and because they'll ask different questions, but um, you know, one family member with a big problem usually isn't that big of a deal. Um, two family members with the same problem up your risk factor, things like that. So you know, it uh, it kind of they they follow actuarial tables that'll just basically tell them, you know, if it's this and this, if it's a highly her hereditable disease that a direct, you know, direct parent had, maybe something like that, that might adjust the risk factor. But 
I don't, from, from my sin, I've seen very few applications where the family history has made a big difference as opposed to the individual history. I don't know what you can. Well, you know, I was surprised when I was getting my insurance in place. I was in my 20s and my mom had had lupus, a brain aneurysm, like all this stuff. And I thought that like, I thought it was going to go south in a big way. Uh, at that time, I wasn't, I didn't hadn't practiced much in the way of insurance because I'm an investment person. Um, but surprisingly, to your point, Rick, it, it, it didn't seem to affect uh, anything. Um, I mean, I was young and, I, and that plays a big, fa <laughs> a big part in things. The younger you are, the less chance your family members are, are going to be sick. Um, and also the healthier you're going to be. So um, for me, I was, I was lucky, but um, yeah. Multiple family have, members with cancer is probably a, a tough. Especially if it's the same one, mm -hmm. right? So if mm -hmm. both parents breast cancer, for example, something like that, that would be a higher risk factor. Uh, I do have a pro tip around the family history thing that came out of an, an experience. I don't, I don't even know if Heather remembers this, but we were doing some applications at the same time for a group of people. And we came to the family history question. One of the people called her mom and said, Hey, mom, when you had the diagnosis, when was that? And her mom's like, what is wrong with you? She's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm just applying for insurance. I'm not at the doctor's. I'm not like her mom was freaking out going, oh, no, no, my baby's sick. And she's going, no, no, I'm just filling out forms. It's all good. I just need to know when you had that thing. Yeah. I'm healthy, mom. I'm safe. <laughs> I thought you were going to take that in another in another way, Rick, about lying lying on insurance applications. That's what I thought too. I thought you were going to yeah. say you want a tip about medical history, just lie about it. Just lie. Do not do that. But here's the tip: <laughs> do not do <laughs> answer one hundred percent truthfully with everything they ask you. Why? But you are not because that will go to medical underwriting. And that is the one thing that could get your insurance claim bounced is if you're, you know, if you're under treatment for cancer and you don't disclose that, that's, that's a problem. Um, mm. You know, the life insurance, something like 98 and a half percent of claims get paid out. Um, and those that don't are just generally because of that kind of lack of disclosure. Mm. Um, but so respond 100% truthfully with everything they ask, but you are not obliged to respond to questions they don't ask. Mm. So if an insurance application asks you, in the last 10 years, have you experienced this? You have to say, you know, yes or no, and here are the details. If it was in the last 10 years, if it was 12 years ago and they didn't ask that, you don't have to disclose the things that happened 12 years ago that they didn't ask about. Uh, it's like giving um, like a testimony prep to witnesses for a trial. Answer the question and only the question. Don't volunteer information. <laughs> don't make stuff up. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, Rick and I, Rick and I played ultimate frisbee together in the past, and there's a lot of alcohol consumption when you're young in, and playing that sport, and oh, uh, so by you know, other people. So you know her as Mad Dog. I was a Mad Dog in Ultimate Frisbee. I was only Mad Dog in ski racing. Oh, <laughs> I think you know. I think that nickname may have translated yeah. over, though. You I and mean, you had enough people in common, I think, between the two. <laughs> I might have showed up. You play ultimate with your ski crowd, and that's what's going to happen. A bit, yeah, mm. but you, 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 like, there are, there's a question on the application about how much alcohol mm. uh, do you consume? Uh, you know, do, whether you want to report daily, weekly, monthly, or uh, you know, are you can are you token up? Uh, how much weed do you smoke all the time? And uh, I wonder how many people lie on the applications about those two items. Mm. I think they probably put a fudge factor on there, honestly, right? Like right. if someone's saying six drinks a week, I think they assume 10. <laughs> um, but it's really funny on the marijuana one because th that'll vary by the place too. So, you know, I know one company that will ask how many times a week. Like you could have a Cheech and Chong bong that's like that big and do that one time a week. And it is totally cool. Right. Because you're only doing it once a week. Right. right according to that application. Hmm. Yeah. Do they ask about illicit drugs too? Like how often do you use heroin? Uh, they ask, have you used this? Because that would be a risk factor. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't necessarily get bounced because of illicit drugs, but they might see it as a higher risk factor. I've got, I've had a client declined on cocaine consumption. Oh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah and they and they got a whole long list too of like on the marijuana side of you know sheesh hookah. Uh, I can't remember the rest of them. Like, have you ever done all of these things I've never heard of? <laughs> have you heard of any of these things? <laughs> to get Urban Dictionary or whatever. That's right, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There was that one. Have party. you ever done Mary Jane? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I'm what I'm hearing is. Uh, lie on the form. I'm just kidding. Don't lie. Answer 100%. Honestly, 100% of all the questions, but don't answer questions they don't ask. Right. The volunteer information. You just got to answer it truthfully. Yeah. And um, even if you do drugs, it doesn't mean that you're going to get bounced. It might affect your risk factor. But if you do too much cocaine, you might get decline it can or it'll depend on the carrier like there are some who are uh will have specialty products for those for example who have uh certain risk factors so that could be a drug use risk factor could be some other ones where the they'd have they kind of say hey we know these folks have a higher risk we've created a product for folks who fall into those categories so what about uh I hope I'm not prematurely jumping over to a different, mm-hmm. slightly different topic, but what about um, people like over in Ukraine right now who have lost loved ones to the war there? Mm-hmm. If, like, what are the chances that they're getting life insurance payouts? So they have certain exceptions that have traditionally showed up on life insurance. So um, suicide traditionally was one, although we hear about policies being paid out more now because it's become realized that it's more of a mental health issue. So uh, it's not that way, but, um, but I think a usually, war zone would be usually there within a, within a year, right? Isn't that what the, how they deal, deal with that? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Sorry. Did I you have something? For... Yeah. Um, put up two but, fingers. So maybe she's okay. saying two years sometimes. Two years, yeah. <laughs> and um, active military service uh, sometimes is one, but the big thing um they'll look for is choosing to go to a war zone for example you know so if you're if you were those like we've got some of those retired service members from here who decide hey i'm gonna go and help out in the ukraine knowing it's an active war zone that might be something where that could be a risk on the insurance policy because it's something they're choosing to enter Mm. So what I've, seen, what I've seen as an exclusion is acts of terrorism or war. Uh, that's what you, but it's generally it's committing acts of terrorism or war is what we tend to see. So if you're, uh, if you're the one walking onto the plane with the bomb, no go on your insurance claim. If you were the passenger <laughs> on the plane with the bomb, chances are it would be paid out. That, that would, they would be paid out. Tend to see. Okay. From my experience, not uh, guaranteed you're going to be paid out if you get right. a plane that has a bomb on it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. That seems fair though and reasonable, right. I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're a suicide bomber, um, you, you would load up on the insurance to take care of your loved ones. Well, that's exactly what they watch for, right? So they'll ask financial questions as well. And, you know, they'll ask your, you know, what's your gross income, your net worth, your debt, you know, if they've got someone who's already, just currently applying for a whack of insurance, they've got, you know, very low net worth, very high debt. Then um, that's one of the questions they're going to ask is like, okay, what's going on with this for the, what's the reason for this insurance, right? Are they planning that an accident could happen? Mm-hmm. Right. That could be a red flag. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um. I'm just looking at the next question here, and I'm really curious about this. Can you tell me about the really morbid risk calculator game? Yeah, yeah. So (laughs) insurance companies have a bunch of places where you can just go online and you can try to figure out how likely it is something bad is going to happen to someone. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so So it's one of those things where sometimes when you find this, you're like, Hmm, how about Uncle Jack? Wonder what's going to happen to him, you know, right? So um, so I've got on my other screen here, Manual Life has one called Insure Right. It says, what's your risk? So Evan, do you want to play along? Yeah, can you, sh- can you screen share? Yeah, sure. Kim, you'll have to uh, remember to bounce that extra stream. Okay, 
All right, so pretty simple, three questions. What's the age or the age you want to tell people you are, Evan? I'm 40. Hey, male? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. okay, this is by birth, not by identification. So okay. It would be different. Okay, smoking status? Non-smoker. Okay, let's see what's going to happen. All right, so your combined risk, disability before age 65, 18%. Critical illness before age 65, 26%. One in four chance you're going to get a critical illness. Died before age 65, 6%. And one of those happening, 40% before age 65. Are they just adding those up? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I don't because think if any one of those happens, then it still goes. So yeah, for what we do, close. you know, so we're looking and saying, you know, so the fun morbid game is just like kind of picking your friends and going, hey, what's going to happen to this person? But, you know, the more useful piece of it is going, okay, what are the things that, could potentially happen to Evan and how do we address those, right? So like we said, dying, pretty low probability for him. Obviously big impact on his family if something happens. Chances of him getting a critical illness, pretty high, like, you know, one in four. Uh. Yeah, and then after 65, it's it's uh, keeps going up. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So, so then what we would do is, you know, we would tend to look at this and say, Okay, so uh, Evan, let's talk about the critical illness piece. You get a cancer diagnosis tomorrow. Uh, what happens with your financial life? Hmm. That was actually a question. <laughs> if I get a critical illness tomorrow? Yeah, you get a cancer screwed. diagnosis tomorrow. We're screwed. We're screwed, Rick. Okay. <laughs> so you're not earning an income probably while you're getting better. Your family might be taking yeah. time off to look after you potentially. You know, have all those healthcare costs that are outside the hospital system, uh, potentially childcare costs, good. things like good. that. All those things kind of add up, right? That's right. And so then, you know, if we, if I was or Kim or anyone, if you were to become aware of something that said, hey, what if you could 30 days later, you could have a check for a hundred grand that just paid to you with no strings attached that you could use tax-free however you want to pay those bills. That may be, be a good call. All right, let's sign up for some critical illness. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you could hope for a GoFundMe. Mm. I mean, really like, or family support well, or look, savings or nice, things like that, right? You're but a nice guy. I don't want to put you in Hulk mode, so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do fair that. enough fair enough well yeah it's, so that's the thing so you know it's funny because one of the things kim and i um in the past i uh, used to belong to a related organization and so we went to a lot of the same sessions i don't know if you ever remember this kim but one of the things they talk about in these sessions is saying hey listen i know that you don't want to sell to your friends because you don't want to be you know just like that person who's a huckster of products to their friends, right? Which I kind of feel that way too. But then if on the flip side, they said, okay, what if a close friend of yours got sick and you hadn't even told them that this thing existed, mm -hmm. right? And that's happened to me a bit on that other side, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, so, you know, at least knowing that it exists, you know, probably something worth checking out and the critical illness thing, you know, it's a pretty high incidence thing. It can have a pretty big impact. You know, and then that disability one, 18% uh, chance. So, you know, one in five chance, basically. And, you know, the thing to look on on that side is, okay, if you were forced to take an unpaid vacation for two years tomorrow, how would that affect your family? Right? How would that affect your life? And, um, you know, if you have, you know, maybe you have savings, maybe you could rely on spouse income, things like that. You've got some kind of plan that's fine, or you've got work coverage. And so, you know, but at least thinking about it and going, okay, I recognize that there's some decent chance this could happen to me. If it did, it would be a big impact. If that is a big impact, how do I address that? Right. Hmm. There's a, a, 
interesting thing that's probably worth talking about in terms of how you figure out what insurance people need and what do those meetings look like? Because they can be long and there's a lot of stuff going on. And the insurance person might decide to just tackle one of those three topics and life insurance versus disability or critical illness, or maybe they're tackling disability. But the facts of the matter is that most people know about life insurance and disability, but that nugget of critical illness, which which everybody knows is, is the h- higher likelihood, that's the one that, that isn't really being purchased or being talked about. And Rick, I'm curious to hear how you think an insurance meeting should go so people do get educated on all three topics and, and get the product that, they're, that they need. You know, I, I think the big... The big thing on that that I see, you know, falling down in these things is that uh, you're right, Kim. I think people often will come in with an identified need, right? Like they're meeting with an advisor. They're like, okay, we want to, we want to get a financial plan in place. And I think there's a danger with that advisors could be aware of to not necessarily just ask for what the client is looking for, but to make sure that they're making um, the clients aware of the other things that they should be thinking about, right? Cause it's very easy to say, oh, okay, we're, we're getting a mortgage. We need to get mortgage insurance. Okay. Here's your quote for mortgage insurance. Do you want to sign up? It's harder to go. Okay. Let's talk about why this is, what's your situation how does this affect your family? Things like that. Like for, for us, we've got a, it's about a five or six page financial worksheet that we tend to use with folks that, asks a bunch of those questions and some of it is around the financial side, some of it is around the risk side, the family situation. And then we kind of use that to kind of go through and say, okay, this is something you feel like you haven't thought about when we talk about how that works. Do you do something like that too, Kim? all over the place, Rick. I'm going to be perfectly honest. And and you probably experience the same thing. Like you kind of start talking with people and you'll go in one direction and the meeting's getting long and you're just thinking, (laughs) does this person have the mental capacity? Uh, And not not saying that in a negative way, but that just the meetings are, there's so much and they're boring and there's so much jargon and there's so much to learn. It's like, do you really bring in a third or, or second or third topic and just, you know, blow people's brains out of the water till they decide they don't want any of it? because it's too much, right, to handle. So it's very difficult to actually do a really good insurance meeting without having to break it up into pieces. But then Mm -hmm. how do you convince people to come back for those other pieces? And at the same time, can you just tackle one topic you know, should you just be selling life insurance? What if they actually need critical illness insurance more or disability Mm -hmm. more? Like, how do you manage all three of these? Oh, yeah, it's it's a challenge for sure. You know, I think for me, it's it's like, what is the priority that's burning up their brain at that moment? Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we address that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, but I, for me, I've, taken lately i've been taking to always throwing in at least a mention of critical illness Mm -hmm. you know it's that you know even if it's the anything else we should know um my i remember there there used to be i promised heather that i would have 1980s tv show and movie references so (laughs) um you know colombo you know peter falk guy with the hat the mustache detective he he had this like you know he'd go in and interview someone and he'd always be about to walk the door and go one more thing you know right so the colombo on that is sometimes critical illness oh yeah before you go um just want to mention this thing you know and even if we don't handle it at that point but it's just uh i think i think because we've seen the impact of that one you know, although we've seen the impact on the positive side, I, I think a lot of us probably know someone who's had a, a cancer diagnosis. Like on the critical illness side, heart attack, stroke, and cancer are kind of the big three by claim. And then there's a big space, and then it's all the other diseases, right? Mm. Um, but, you know, for any of us who've known someone who's had a cancer diagnosis, like it can make a big difference financially between that friend who, like I have a friend who is a single mom, had signed up for this without even thinking much about it. She just, you know, um, was said, told at one point, hey, you should do this. She ended up going, okay, sure, signed up for it. And then got a cancer diagnosis, got $50,000 that helped her pay for her childcare, her house expenses, stuff like that. Well, she got better. 
And then, you know, had other friends who similar diagnosis, but without that kind of financial support. And so for me, I agree, Kim, like, you know, I think it was the Buddha who said uh, the brain can only take what the bum can endure. Um, you know, you get to that point where <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure that was Buddha, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, him or to, Jesus. It, it might have been him. Yeah. Um, but where people are drifting. So it's like, okay, hey, what's the burning issue? But at least mention that. And if we have to follow up on that one, then sometimes we've got to do that. Um. Well, one of the goals of our of this podcast, or if our listeners are listening to it, our hope is that there's at least enough general information that they can hear it once or twice, digest it, and then when they walk into an office of someone like a Kim or a Rick, that they know at least the basics of the difference between these um, things. So I guess my question is maybe a dumb one. And I think I caught the gist of what critical illness is, but what's the difference between disability insurance and critical illness insurance? Well, not to worry, Heather, there are no dumb questions, just dumb people. Um, So uh, (laughs) uh, So, uh, big differences. So life, if you die, you get paid. Disability, if you can't work, it pays you, generally speaking, a portion of your income. So there's debt-based disability as well that will pay your regular recurring expenses instead. But most of the time, it's income-based. So two-thirds of your income is the most common, and that's what you'll most commonly see with work plans as well. Right. Critical illness pays you a lump sum of money, tax-free, 30 days after a diagnosis. So it doesn't matter if you're working or not, if you get better or not, um, you know, if you're spending it on a trip to Disneyland or if you're spending it on healthcare, um, none of those things matter. You don't have so, to submit receipts or it's not no. for parking at the hospital or anything like be. that. It's just, but it's just money that you get. Yeah. It's just a check tax-free that's given to you. So your doctor, you fill out a form, your doctor fills out a form, confirms the diagnosis, and then... 30 days later, here's a tax-free check. Hope you get better. It's your money. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's a list of prescribed diagnoses. Like it doesn't cover everything. It's not an infected toenail or something, but right. there would be a list of illnesses or conditions that are that don't qualify little, for that. Don't payout. be little people suffering from ingrown toenails, <laughs> Heather. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't claim for it on CI. Um, okay. Yeah. So there's, it, 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 but you basically that list should come up when you're signing up for the insurance. So every carrier will have a different list and it'll range. I mean, there's some that just do cancer, you know, and, and sometimes it's just going, okay, that's the biggest risk one. That's the one that I'm, I'm concerned about because family or friends experience. And, and then I, I think the bigger ones go up to about 25 or 26 um conditions so they'll add on things like alzheimer's ms uh brain tumors you know all kinds of things like that that um you know are still considered critical illnesses they're lower on the incidence scale than the other ones but still have a pretty big effect on people's lives gotcha. yeah i remember kim kim you talked about critical illness on this podcast right well it was a long time ago <laughs> yeah yeah. Okay. No, I remember we talked about this before. And one of the things that I remember you mentioned about it was, you know, say you get a critical illness or, or an illness that's insurable for a critical illness policy and, but also for disability insurance, well, disability doesn't start tomorrow. It can take quite a bit of time before you start getting your disability. And so you were saying that can be one way that critical illness can be helpful. Is that right? Yes, I'll, I'll let Rick take this over because he's our guest today, but yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it can bridge because uh, depending on, especially if it's a work policy that you have through disability, some workplaces will have short-term disability. Sometimes they rely on EI disability benefits. Those things can delay. The other thing is work policies are generally total disability. So you have to not be able to work at all. Um, and, you know, a lot of the times with recovery, especially from illness we're kind of coming back part-time things like that um so it can have more of those conditions attached to it and like i said critical illness is just basically here's here's a check Hmm. Hmm. 
what I'm going to ask the, the question Kim always asks. I'm going to beat her to the punch. What is the, <laughs> what's the cost difference for various kinds of insurance? I understand that it has to do with risk and your age and that kind of stuff. But um, can you, is there a general theme of like, is life insurance, does it tend to be more expensive than critical illness or? So I would say uh, disability is usually higher up on the expense scale. Uh, and that's just because it's something that they could be covering you for your entire life. Right. Right. Um, you know, so at Evan's age, that could be a, that could be a 45 or 50 year bill that the disability company could be paying. So, um, so that's the one that is usually more expensive. And then it's, um, it also has more underwriting in my experience. You know, there's a, a joke among a, an insurance professional that I used to work with who worked for an insurance company. And he, he used to say to clients, okay, we're going to apply for all these things to be covered. We're not going to get them. <laughs> like just being right up front that the right. underwriters will try it. There, there's something that they're going to put on there and say, you're not going to be covered for disability for back issues because uh, that's, you know, something you'd had. There's, you know, I've, I've almost never seen a disability application where it just went, yep, yeah, you're good. We got you for everything, right? There's right. Something. There's so it's something really special. focusing on, okay, what are the other thousand things that it does cover me for, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I had a, uh, you know, a veterinarian who they said, well, we're not going to cover you for disability due to sleep apnea. And he's going like, I'm concerned a bull's going to step on me, so you can have your sleep apnea, right? <laughs> like <laughs> good attitude. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would say life insurance is the, generally speaking, the least expensive of the three and will have a lower level of underwriting than criticalness. Criticalness will kind of fall in between the two. Okay. Uh, price wise for life insurance, what they will do, they will look at your age, which you can't change. Your smoker status, which you kind of can change. Uh -huh. We'll talk about that. Um, and then things like they'll look at weight just within a certain build chart. So, you know, they basically got a for a uh, for a certain weight, they would like you to be at least a certain height. Uh -huh. You know, some people are a little too short. Um, and then uh, if you're outside of that build chart in either direction, then that could be affected a little bit. Um, and then the other big difference isn't actually the amount of insurance. The other big difference is the time that that insurance is guaranteed for. Ah. At the low end of the scale, they're going to guarantee those rates for 10 years. And then they'll see a massive increase. You don't want to keep it usually past that 10-year period. At the other end of the scale, they'll guarantee it for life. Right. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've kept paying your premiums, 100 percent sure they're going to pay that out at some point. So it's more expensive because their risk is higher. And okay. then it goes in between, you know, 20 years, 30 years, things like that. So the difference between having, you know, two hundred thousand dollars of coverage and four hundred thousand dollars of coverage isn't double. You know, it's a relatively small difference that way. But there's a bigger difference between having it guaranteed for 20 years versus having it guaranteed for four years. Hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, does the critical illness work the same way in that it will be guaranteed for a certain amount of time? Or is that more of a lifetime thing as long as you're paying your premiums? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, there are different products out there. So, and it's just the guarantee of the rates. So you will still have coverage with most of these. It's just, they become so horribly expensive that it, for most folks, they don't hang on to it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So criticalness insurance I've seen as low as uh, five year changes. Um, but we see like 10, 10 and 20 are pretty common. Then to age 65 is pretty common. And then there are some life ones as well. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very, very mm -hmm. helpful. Um, Kim, do you have something? You look like maybe you want to say something. Well, I think the insurance industry is, uh, 
I mean, it's so important. I don't know if people realize how important it is to have insurance. And and the reason I say that is because 99% of the people I meet with, which is mostly on the investment side, have absolutely no idea what they have for life insurance coverage individually and through their work. They have no idea what they know they have disability at work, but they don't know what it covers them for and they don't know the amount. And then they're, they definitely don't know if their work policy has critical illness or travel insurance insurance. And um, it's just a wide open world of, of people maybe having stuff, but not knowing what it is that they have or people who have nothing and um, maybe need to talk to somebody like Rick to put something in place to transfer that risk to the insurance companies. Rick, do you find the same thing when you meet with people? They just have absolutely no idea what they have for coverage and what they need. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the time. I mean, sometimes you have folks who are very organized. They've got everything laid out. But a lot of the times, that's yeah, you know, we're not quite sure until they start looking at it and then going, or they think they've got one thing, they've got a different thing. You know, they oh, I've got this life insurance, but then we look and it's accidental death and disability, just kind of like life insurance, but it's only in an accident, mm. and you're six times more likely to die from illness than you are from an accident. So maybe not as helpful Mm -hmm. right so uh yeah so i think that is the case and you know it's a tough thing to look at sometimes people just don't even know how to approach it right it's not one of those things that is as much as they're you know the occasional ads and things it's not something that's top of mind until it really is top of mind (laughs) right right you know we uh i've got a, a colleague in the group benefit business and he, uh, the way that I am with those GoFundMe campaigns, he is with disability insurance on group plans because, um, just because of personal family history, because we'll sometimes get clients say, Hey, should we be still paying for this disability thing? Or people don't want to pay for disability because they're never going to use it. Uh, so this colleague of mine, his wife, uh, uh, late wife now ended up getting diagnosed with a brain tumor and she was on disability for five years before uh, she eventually passed away. And, you know, and there he, he goes like, yeah, you never want disability until you absolutely need it. And then it is like the one thing that you need. Right. Cause it makes so much difference when you're going through something. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and the pandemic has probably um, maybe turn people's attention to insurance a bit more. What would you say around that, Rick? Yeah, I think so. I think people have kind of realized that we're mortal <laughs> a little bit. Right? Well, I think the thing is I'll for, for younger, healthy folks, it's uh, a lot of the time we, um, you know, we tend to think, oh, well, those kinds of things won't happen to me. But Correct. I think the nature of COVID, it was so random that it's easier for people to say, okay, well, I could have caught that. I could have caught anything. Oh, are there still people that don't have it? Uh, yeah, well, there probably some. <laughs> Somebody out there, I'm looking around, I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There was a little nugget that Rick mentioned earlier that I was really hoping we could come back to because I don't think we've talked about it on this podcast. And we're, we always talk about like just the typical average person, but there's so many people out there who are not typical average people. They maybe have uh, a major mental health issue or they have a history of having had cancer or they, um, you know, just have maybe generally not a healthy lifestyle. And what do those people do when it comes to insurance? Is there an insurance a product out there that we uh, can can help people out with when they're not the perfect picture of health. And Rick kind of dropped a little nugget on simplified insurance a while ago. And I think this is really important because there's a lot of people maybe who aren't pursuing insurance because they don't think they qualify. Right. Yeah. Tell us more about that, Rick. Yeah, sure. So there, um, like Kim mentioned, so simplified insurance is basically a product category where It'll go all the way up to guaranteed issue. I've, I had an insurance company say we can we can insure everybody, um, but you know not at the same amount of coverage necessarily, and definitely not at the same cost. But um, 
you know, short of folks who are in palliative care, it is possible to get something. But And Kim's absolutely right. I've had people tell me flat out, I'm not applying for insurance because I couldn't get it, you know, because they had any experience applying for something under a standard product that maybe knocked them out. But there are options out there. So what they'll do is they'll basically price things a little differently. And, you know, the very best ones to me have different a different application process. So one of my favorites, you can actually go through and it'll go from like the, are you imminently dying questions? Okay, you make it past that one. <laughs> to, are you in, you know, long-term care? Do you need assistance with your activities of daily living? You know, are you under treatment for this? Goes on. So it's basically, you cross another hurdle, you move on to the next less expensive version of insurance and basically when you get to one that you can't answer um then you stop there and go okay that's my insurance that's my insurance coverage that i can get oh interesting but there are options out there for a huge wide range of folks and even some of the ones like you know probably after being a smoker being a private pilot is like maybe next on the on the <laughs> insurance list um but there are you know specialty products out there that are just built for private pilots that go, hey, we know this risk is, you know, higher than average, but these folks still need coverage. And so we want to be able to offer something to them. Yeah. I mean, uh, in the military, we have, there's insurance that's specifically uh, carried, well, it's underwritten by Manulife, but they have, they have insurance that is specifically for military personnel. And there's limits on it. You can't get a million dollar policy. Mm -hmm. Last I checked, I think it was 600,000 is the limit, but yeah, there's no matter what you do, it seems there's insurance for you somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So it really just then comes down to a, a cost benefit decision, right? Because the, the reality is sometimes it's just kind of priced out of people's budgets or scope. And, you know, in some cases, you can kind of do the math and say, okay, well, you know, for that amount of premium, you could also just, you know, save that and invest it or something like that, right. depending on how far the cost goes, you know, there, there sometimes will be cases where you'll say, well, if we put that into a TFSA and if it got a conservative rate of return, it would turn into this and they can kind of decide if that's something that makes sense to them or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those are kind of outlier situations where that would be even yeah. Worth doing that analysis, I would imagine. Yeah. Or, or the other thing to watch for, too, is is guaranteed issue offers that will sometimes come up, for example, through work. So, you know, sometimes through your employer, they'll they have these optional life insurance things, which they'll, where you can basically buy extra. And, you know, often that will part of the the piece of that is that there will be some guarantee on it. Or sometimes it's a short-term campaign, right? So sometimes we'll have, you know, with one of our groups, they'll say, okay, within the month of September, you can buy $100,000 of life insurance with no medical questions. You know, mm -hmm. so that can really work out, you know, like we mentioned, those folks are sometimes a little too short for their weight. Um, you know, that's an example where, you know, they could, and and but are otherwise like healthy and active and all these kinds of things, don't smoke, all those kinds of pieces. Something like that is a great opportunity because then they're not getting dinged because of that piece and they're able to access that insurance. I'm going to ask that, I guess this is for Kim and for Rick maybe, but I mean, you know, just out in the world, you hear people complaining and maligning insurance companies, right? I mean, I don't know if they've ever done it in front of you or you've ever heard these things that people say, oh, insurance is a waste of money or it's just, you know, they're greedy companies and da, 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 da. So like, what do you say, I guess, to that? Like, I guess I've heard here that, that this idea of like managing risk is, is a big response to that, right? It's a small price to pay to get um, supported when you really need it. But I mean, is there any truth to that kind of perception? Have you heard people saying that before? Yeah, those are the other insurance people. Those are the home and auto people. They're, no, I'm, I, <laughs> well, I think that's, 
That's more often where I've heard complaints is on the home uh, nominal titles. It's yeah. fair to, to those folks. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, having put a bunch of life, you know, and CI claims and things like that through our office, they're um, very, very commonly paid. Now, mm -hmm. there's a catch to be aware of, and that's um, uh, what is more accurately called creditor insurance. Okay, so that's that's so, and uh, this isn't kind of my opinion thing. So there's a W five piece on it. So the creditor insurance is the bank stuff typically. The big difference being that in a lot of cases they don't underwrite when you're applying; they underwrite at the time of claim. So when you, you know, if you go to Kim and you say, "Hey Kim, I want to sign up for life insurance. I need to cover my mortgage," she'll ask a bunch of horribly invasive medical questions, send it off to an underwriter. They'll have all that information. They'll make a decision on it. And then they are stuck with you. <laughs> you know, as long as you answer truthfully and paid all your premiums, they are stuck with you for as long as you keep that insurance. You can cancel any time, but but it uh, doesn't work on their end. On, if you pass away, they have to pay. That's a contract. If, They're if you were honest, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. With, with creditor insurance, if it's underwritten at the time of claim, then kind of retroactively, you could have been paying premiums all this time. Um, and retroactively, they'll go back and say, okay, is there anything that we should have known about on the health side that would have resulted in this denying a claim? That's kind of what that W-5 investigation looked into, that side of things. And that one was more dubious. So that's the thing that I think I would suggest people watch for. But they don't ask you at the time that you apply those health questions? No, it's, it's not medically underwritten. They may be just really vague ones or things like that. But basically, it's kind of we take all comers and we'll figure it out when they claim. I think we've had this conversation before a little bit, and it just continues to blow my mind every time I hear it. So they say, they're like, here's insurance. If you die of a heart attack, you're going to get your mortgage paid off. And then you die of a heart attack. And then they're like... Oh, well, we're looking back at your records and like you had high blood pressure and we you should have heard that. So, and uh, <laughs> so that's a pre existing condition. We don't pay out on pre existing conditions. But they didn't ask about it, but they can still deny. The, oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah so, oh. this was the impetus for oh. our guest getting her life insurance license. Remember, Heather? Well, was that Krista? Krista, yeah, that was yeah. fine because she had a client that, because she sold her mortgage, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, the husband died mm -hmm. and then didn't pay out. The insurance didn't pay out. But it gets worse, in my opinion. This is the okay. worst part about creditor insurance. The longer you pay, the less you get out of it. Because as you yeah. pay the mortgage down, that's that's what's insured. is like the amount remaining on your mortgage. Right. That makes yeah. zero sense because... I mean, I don't know exactly the price difference, Rick, maybe you can tell us, but for like a term yeah. life insurance policy that covers the length of your mortgage of 20 years or something like that, yeah. it's probably going to be around a similar price only after your mortgage is paid off, you still have the insurance. My experience, and I don't know about yours, Kim, my experience is most of the time when people have gotten a quote from the bank and then we do like a term 20 quote for them, they look at ours and say, wow, that's so much less. <laughs> like seriously, so your paying more for a worse product that you pay for and the bank owns that um, as you pay for pay off your mortgage is worth less and less. Right. Where if you get a traditional policy, it's worth, if you're getting 500,000, it's worth 500,000, no matter when you die, it's that consistent amount. And, yeah. and then if you happen to die when you have $3 of wing on your mortgage, then awesome. You have 400 and, yeah, 99,000. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Something like that. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is that the creditor one just tend to, tends to go loan to loan, right? So it's, you know, for a five-year term, if something happens to your health during that five years, then you go to apply, things can change, things like that. Whereas if you, you know, just put a term 20 in place, it would travel with you. If you sold your house, went out to a new house, goes through mortgage renewal, it just carries on. Mm -hmm. Just do it once and you're covered for those next 20 years. Can we speak uh, ill of, of bank employees on this podcast? or maybe not the employees because you know they're people but the banks can speak ill of them <laughs> because they seem to be just the worst 
Kim, Kim just cringed, did a major cringe. Here's the, here's the thing. So when somebody gets hired by the bank, they're excited about the job. If they're working for a big bank. They're getting probably extremely good training and they learn uh, good like a lot of really good business habits. The the tough thing though, is the training only goes so far. And sometimes the bank is asking people to do things that they don't have training on and they're extremely uncomfortable about it. So people who start out as customer service reps or whatever, whatever you want to call the bank term for that, that particular job or the lender, they aren't trained on insurance. They're trained on lending, but the bank has a, a mandate to uh, offer this type of insurance. So the lender is out there talking about this insurance. They are extremely uncomfortable about it because they don't know what questions, they don't know how to answer the questions the person might have. So they're they're offering it because they're really told to offer it. And they're from the lenders I know, they're extremely uncomfortable about talking about it because they're not insurance advisors. They aren't like they aren't licensed for insurance. You, you'll find insurance licensed brokers out there. So people outside of the bank, but it would be rare to find somebody who works at the bank, who's a lender, who is uh, life and uh, sickness uh, licensed to sell insurance. So I feel bad for them, to be perfectly honest. They don't know, they don't have the skill set to offer this product. And the banks are, are telling them to, to bring it up and, and to tack it on as a little, you know, sprinkles on top of your, your loan that you just got out. So. Yeah. That's why I clarified. That's why I, I qualified my comment, Kim, not the people, bless their hearts, the banks, the banks themselves just seem like the worst. Uh, it's, like they, it's like they hate their own clients. <laughs> Well, they're trying to make their money, I guess, is uh, <clears throat> is how that works. So this is, uh, this is why you need to talk to Rick or you need to talk to someone like Kim or someone like Rick because. Right. Look at the big picture. They don't well, need you. Yeah. And I, I think like really, to Kim's point, really basic question. If they're looking at insurance, are you licensed to sell life insurance? You know? Are you life licensed in the province that you are resident in? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's a pretty simple, basic qualifying question. And if that is, you know, if that is a no, or if it's a, well, I've got this and this and this, then it's probably better to look elsewhere for something as important as that. And that's like, that's pretty, having your life license is not insignificant. I mean, I've never done the test, but I have uh, brothers that have done the test and my dad used to sell life insurance and mutual funds and stuff. So I like, I understand and Rick, please uh, shed some light on this, but I understand it's a pretty rigorous challenging test that you've got to study for you. You have to have a pretty broad knowledge base in order to get that license. Yep, for sure. Yeah, for life and for accident and sickness as well. So they're two different pieces. And the other big piece is that in order to maintain your license, you have to keep up quite a bit of continuing education. That's And it's Alberta Insurance Council is probably the most stringent in the country, uh, whereas where like they have to approve a specific course for a certain amount of CE credit. Uh, for it to, to go. So it can't be like I listen to a motivational speaker and I'm going to count that as my professional development. It's like this specific course qualifies for 0.5 CE on accident and sickness. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so, yeah, there's a lot that you need to do, get the license and then keep it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there are a couple more questions. I don't know if we're running out of time or not, but um, I know that you work with a lot of companies who offer and do group benefits, and I know you've assisted uh, me in the past for sure with those. Um, what are some of the things that, or risks that employees or employers should know um, about those plans? Sure. Uh, so I think the big ones, uh, opting out, uh, don't do it <laughs> I, from an employer side or an employee side. I think that's one of the biggest risks that you can face. So with group benefit plans, ideally, they should be mandatory for every full time staff in an organization. Um, for sure, long term disability and life need to be um, because they just they need to be able to get that coverage on that and generally plans will ask for that, but they'll sometimes give an ability to opt out of the health and dental, for example. Uh -huh. 
So you can do that. Um, in some cases, some employers will allow you to do that. Now, if you do that as an employee, and then you later on decide that you want to get back on the plan, or you 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 know you actually need it, then you have to go through underwriting at that point. So you join an organization, you know, and you know, you join Evans Law Firm, and you when you join, you have the chance to sign up, and it's guaranteed, no questions, for sure. You just say, hey, oh, uh, you know, budget's a little tight. I don't know if I'm not going to the dentist anytime soon. I don't want to pay my half the premium. I'm I want to wait. Then they'll look and say, okay, well, now you need to fill out a medical form that needs to go to underwriting. Maybe they put exclusions on it, things like that. Oh, uh, yeah. For employers, opting out can be a risk because it's still, the employer is still going to be on the hook for that, um, even if the employee chose not to sign up. So there was a story about a fellow who um, he was working on a job site. He was a construction guy and they had given him the papers for it. And uh, he, uh, when he, he died on the job, they ended up finding the papers in his toolbox unsigned. And the company was on the hook for the death claim because you know, they couldn't prove that they had gone far enough to make sure that he had signed off on that stuff. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. So big risk on that side. Um, yeah. And then the other big one that we see a lot of the place is the contractor piece. So companies should never have contractors on a plan. Like, oh, as that. interesting. Most okay. group benefit plans will say, you know, needs to be a qualified full time employee to be on the benefit plan. So the danger is. They go to do a uh, long-term disability claim. Long-term disability company comes back and says, uh, hey, um, this was a contractor, not a full-time employee. They don't qualify under the plan. Person lawyers up, and then the company's on the hook to pay that long-term disability claim because they put the contractor on there. Oh, yeah. And I can see how this could get even better. Yeah. And then, like, then they get rid of the contractor, yeah. and that brings that same lawyer Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, guess what? He actually was an employee. So now you owe him severance pay because you had him on the health plan. Right. Yes. <laughs> the ways of proving they're an employee, right? And then the right. other piece of that is that is Revenue Canada has this thing called a personal services corporation. So personal services corporation is if Revenue Canada sees this person listed as a contractor who's only working for one company. And they decide, yeah, no, you weren't a contractor. You were effectively an employee. And then they say, hey, contractor, you know, all those deductions you've been making for the last five years, you need to pay all those back on Revenue Canada. Ooh. Hey, company, you know, all those EI and CPP payments that you haven't been paying, you need to start paying those back. Oh, I think we're going to give you a fine as well. Like it's, it's, it's big and nasty and there's no appeal for it. So, um, you know, yeah. So if you're a contractor working for a company, you know, there are some, you know, is this person an employee or not kind of questionnaires out there that you can follow. There are a few ones on the site, on the, uh, on the web, but I think uh, make sure you're working for more than one company. If you have employees who are working for you as a contractor, that's one of those kind of litmus tests they use. There's those kinds of things, but if you are, one person working for one company and, you know, and they're providing you tools, things like that. Big, big danger on there. Mm -hmm. Much better to get on as an employee or not be on the plan. We're talking mm -hmm. about, we're talking about um, mitigating risk. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say, if you're that person who's like, I'm going to be a contractor. Yeah. Let's mitigate that risk by talking to an employment lawyer yeah. and or accountant mm -hmm. to see like, because why do people normally do this? I think it's because they're like, hey, it's simpler paperwork, they think, mm -hmm. and I can avoid paying taxes legally. Yeah, tax deductions, right? And so why don't you talk to a lawyer and an accountant? Because there's no simple, if you're going to be in business somehow, whether it's as mm -hmm. a, uh, uh, having a business that's having contractors work for it or being someone who's going to be a contractor, like just just, will you just do that, please? Just talk to a lawyer, talk to an accountant. And then if you are an employee, get on that benefits plan and don't opt out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and if you, if you're an employer and you're thinking about the contractor thing, 
talk to your group benefits person. Uh, and if, uh, if they say, yeah, totally cool to put contractors on there, go back to step one, talk to your lawyer, <laughs> talk to your <laughs> accountant, as Evan said, cause, um, cause the, the folks, so I'm members of this national organization, Canadian group insurance brokers, and we have a very common philosophy. I think among everyone there saying, yeah, you know, every once in a while you see someone post on the kind of Slack channel saying, hey, I've got this company who wants to put on contractors. And the general response is next. <laughs> As in, there's a lot of companies you could work with. You don't want to work with that one if you can't convince them not to put contractors on there. Um, yeah. 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 What if you're the contractor, but you want disability insurance then? Is that something an individual can just get? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There are um, there are companies out there who will offer single person disability, and they'll break it up either by illness or illness and injury. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's yeah, it's injury only or injury and illness, and then uh, and then they'll also tie in, for example, health and dental. Uh, so, and it's your choice whether you want to sign up for just one or just the other one. And so, yeah, that can be a really good call to sign up for. Those will be generally based on your uh, income. So not necessarily T4 income because they recognize that contractors get paid in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So they can base it on kind of gross corporate income. Mm -hmm. And also uh, for those ones, you can be a sole proprietor. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to be incorporated as a contractor. You can be a sole proprietor instead. Okay. So there are options there out there for those contractor folks. Um, yeah. Other it's than not on the company plan, just don't go on the employee plan of any of the, of the companies you're working for. Are there any other groups, Rick, that you can kind of be a part of that aren't related to your work, but like for insurance purposes to get in on a group insurance plan? I mean, there are lots of affiliate groups out there, right? So there might be an organization plan through your union or your association or things like that, right? That aren't necessarily employer tied. So Heather mentioned in the intro, we work with teachers and school board employees because we run a voluntary benefits program for teachers and school board employees across the province. So anyone who works for a school board in Alberta has access to group insurance rates on you know, CI and life insurance. So from your association, there are often things like that. So, if, you know, it might be a, your dental association or things like that. Um, that can be a place you can look at sometimes to access those kinds of group rates. And they are tied to the employer. So when I mentioned those guaranteed issue offers, so, you know, we have those about every year for the school board employees, we run one that's either critical illness or life insurance um, where they have that guaranteed issue offer and it, you know, they just have to work for a school board. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's through their employer or not. Gotcha. Nice. Um, okay. I think this is the last question I have for you, although, okay. um, so with everything we've talked about in mind, is there something or some things that everyone should be looking at to reduce their risk? Uh, yes. Everyone should have an emergency plan, like fund an emergency plan. Okay. Really simple one. Start a tax-free savings account, mm. right? Like, so uh, put some money into that. Put into an investment that isn't terribly high risk um, and just let that sit there and grow. It's, you know, tax-free savings account of, as opposed to your regular checking account. So you're not, you know, uh, tempted to go out and blow it because there's a sale on Converse, right? So <laughs> tax-free savings account, you can get it within a couple of days. I've been watching my Google searches. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, but... But it's it's nice because it's just that little bit separated, right? So it takes a couple of days to get it. It's an extra step. So it kind of forces you to go, okay, how badly do I want to access this? Uh, but, you know, so three to six months salary or three to six months expenses is usually the goal that we suggest. And it doesn't have to be all at once, but start building up to it. Just get a monthly, regular monthly contribution going in there. And that's just the, you know, Oh my God, something happened. We need to pay the rent this month. 
you know, right. Bill, it's, it's just that emergency piece. And that one's really simple and it doesn't depend on your health and everybody has access to it. It doesn't depend on their income levels or how you get paid or anything. So yeah, I, to me, everyone should do that. I think way more people should look at critical illness insurance than they are. And especially if you have debts, then look at the life side. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think, Kim? Yeah, well, I was in that scenario. So my husband yeah. was sick and he had uh, an illness that isn't covered by any insurance on the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happened to be in the investment world. So of course I had savings and a $30,000 check was cut and I didn't have to worry about my situation. And uh, that kind of is a, a perfect example of what Rick's talking about. Sometimes things pop up and if you're not prepared for it, life can get pretty hard. But if you happen to be tucking a little bit of safety money away aside then then life isn't going to be so hard and money makes a difference like you know it, it makes a significant difference so i think i think rick hit the nail on the head uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and i guess in any sort of budget range um sitting down with someone like kim or rick um they can look at that and say okay well you know if you've only got x amount of dollars to um, set aside every month to, you know, plan for these, um, plan for these risks, then you can help them put those dollars to best use. Yeah. The real best practice, Heather, is to do it off the, off the bat and make it automatic. Uh, you know, I think uh -huh. the big challenge we see with savings all the time is people try to do it with what's left over at the end of the month. Yeah. And for a lot of us, no matter how much we make, there's nothing left over at the end of the month, right? <laughs> or how little. Uh, so it's really saying, okay, what's something that my budget could absorb and then get it automatically coming out of my bank account as soon as my paycheck goes in, going into my savings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I'm not even thinking about, I don't see it. Uh -huh. You know, that Converse sale comes on and uh, it's like, well, that money's not in my account, so I can't spend that. <laughs> Right. That's right. Um, yeah. So making it automatic, making an amount that, you know, even if you start small, but just get it going and just dripping into that account every month without thinking about it. Uh -huh. And then it doesn't require any willpower. Like it takes the sum total of time that it takes for Kim to set up a TFSA for you. How long do you think it would take if someone just wanted a simple TFSA to set up, Kim? Oh, well, with me, like 10 seconds, right? right. But, uh, yeah, right. Well, yeah, I mean, with, the, with the bank, you're going to have to make an appointment. And we already talked about how the bank hates you, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, go, to, go to Kim. Go to Kim. <laughs> She's right. So, like, it's honestly, like, tax-free savings account is, like, a couple of minutes of filling out a form. Yeah, yeah. You know, with a yeah. Kim or Rick or whatever, right? So, like, yeah. take the time to do that. Have enough willpower to do that. And then set it up automatically and then just forget that it exists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so that's, you know, we're all about doing good things for you that make your life easy, that are just really simple and lazy. Yeah. And if you hit 65 or 80 or whatever, and you don't haven't had to use it, then all the better. You've got like a really nice trip somewhere or several trips or <laughs> whatever. Or is, you have right? the ability to pay for the long-term care that uh, 720 out of 1,200 of us will need. Yeah, you can buy like a really nice scooter. Right. Yeah, true, true. As long as it's keeping pace with inflation. Well, if it's properly invested, it'll be outpacing inflation. Exactly. But that's a great point because your standard GICs, right? They're like, what, quarter to a half percent? Oh my gosh. Right now. And so they're so losing ground to inflation money, every month. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, get into something, a nice balanced investment that's outpacing inflation. And then, then that's earning compound interest and helping you and growing over time. Uh huh. So Rick, we never really actually dug into what it is that people can call you up to do. And I think that's, I mean, that's a uh, an important thing to cover here. If people are listening to this episode, yeah. can they come to you for everything to do with insurance? What can they call you for? Um, so folks contact us a lot from organizations. So looking for their, their group benefits, group RSPs. And most of the folks we work with on the individual side, not all of them, but most of them are members of an organization that we work with. So most of them 
uh, either we do group benefits or group RSPs for their organization, and then we work with the individuals inside that organization, or they're a teacher and on teaching staff to school board because we work with all of them as individuals. Um, you know, if they're just if they're an individual wanting advice, want to set something up, if they're a sole proprietor looking for disability insurance, for sure we can help them. But that's uh, that's the the small definitely the smaller proportion of people that we work with. Yeah, you know, most of the time we're doing. We do a ton of financial wellness sessions uh, for folks that belong to these organizations across the province. So we'll do them through the organization, and you know, we almost inevitably have people coming out of that saying, "Okay, that made me, uh, you know, curious, freaked out, panicked, hitting the send button before you finish talking, whatever." <laughs> um, you know, and then they're setting up and going to ask, coming in, sitting down, asking questions. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I feel like this conversation is kind of like the conversation about having or making wills, right? It's <laughs> sort of like everybody knows it's there. It's a possibility. It's right. a real risk <laughs> or an eventuality. Um, but it's something that none of us really like to, th many of us don't like to think about much or right. want to spend money on. Um, but I think there's some peace of mind that can come from taking the time and throwing a little bit of money at it to make yeah, it's you not, feel better. It's not the sexiest product, right? It's right. not those chucks that Heather keeps on thinking about buying. I know. Or yeah, the bathroom remodel or the, you know, yeah. I've got a list. I but have a list. <laughs> it's real sexy if you have to use it. Then yeah. it becomes like the sexiest purchase you ever made in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like all of a sudden your loved one is hooked up to tubes and you don't have a full say in what happens to them because the doctors don't have any kind of a living will on file. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. How sexy is it then? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, right. Or all of a sudden, if it's unclear who's going to be taking care of your kids, because mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. gone, Will would be pretty sexy at that particular time. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know what your loved one wanted and you know what to mm -hmm. do. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and how, how sexy is it if you just walk away with a $50,000 check because you got a bad diagnosis? Right. Most yeah. people don't get like, well, I shouldn't say most people, people that don't have critical illness don't get that bonus check for getting the bad news. They just get the bad news without the check. Yeah. And then the freak out about how they're going to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. All the expenses are going to come. Yeah. Right. So it's that peace of mind piece, you know, and a lot of folks go on the, you know, the CI say, well, I've got disability through my work. And we're like, okay, so your spouse gets sick. What happens then? Like you're going to be taking time off work to look after them your disability won't cover you taking time off work to look after your spouse. Right. So you got to do something. How do you, how do you help to cover that? How do you bridge that? And CI is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. Lots of options. Kim, did he, uh, did Rick do you proud? Rick did amazing. I'm, I'm, <laughs> If I needed benefits, I would call Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Just writing down that recommendation. That's going to be the tagline for this episode. Right. <laughs> I need benefits, but yeah. I don't. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, but, you know, it's funny, Kim, because uh, when I was talking to Heather about this, she was saying, well, you know, Evan and I often get to geek out on the law stuff and Kim doesn't get to geek out on the financial stuff so much. So this will be a, you know, a pleasant change. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, a, you know, you're like a peer and it's it's fun <laughs> To, to have somebody come on the podcast and we can advocate for people in our industry because mm -hmm. sometimes people think that, you know, somebody has an agenda or, or something mm -hmm. out there, but there are, and which is true, but the majority mm -hmm. of professionals are so amazing at what they do. And we want people to know that they, you know, quite likely if they listen to our podcast, they're going to get a great professional. They can <laughs> call them up and say, I need some help. And they're going to be able to help them and give uh, with integrity. So I just, like, I love having financial professionals on here so people can see, you know, how skilled they are, how smart they are, and how capable they are of solving uh, for what people are looking for. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But it's a true service and not a sales job, right? Yeah. yeah. If it's Absolutely. done right. Yeah. If they're good, if they're good, which, you know, uh -huh. we know Rick's good because we know Kim's good and 
Kim just said Rick's good. So I, I can actually, vouch. she I can... said that if she needed benefits, she would go to me. Um, <laughs> but you know, but just it's, to repeat it's that, thing, <laughs> it's, but it's the same thing with the legal world, right? Like, sure. um, that, you know, obviously, you know, lawyers aren't often, especially in private practice, aren't necessarily low known for their low income levels. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I think a lawyer uh, would be ill served his profession and clients if that if they were really just focused on the billing uh-huh. right i think mm, the vast majority of lawyers are focused on doing what's absolutely the right thing for their clients mm-hmm. yes sure there are costs to doing that but that's it's not after the cost it's not saying hey if i can get in these 10 more billable hours and i'm going to buy this thing it's like what do we need to do the right thing for our clients yeah mm-hmm. to get this done yeah, yeah. that's right well, I can vouch for Rick too. He's helped me and, uh, you know, other businesses with our benefits and we've been nothing but pleased. So you got two, two thumbs up, four thumbs up from this episode, at least. So. Four thumbs up. I've got two. Yeah, write that down. Write that down. Right. Now. That's right. <laughs> you put those underneath your signature on your email. That's right. <laughs> Four thumbs up, Heather Mallory. If I needed benefits, I would call Rick Kim McDonald. That's right. I think those are going to be my previews when I share this on my socials. <laughs> Fantastic. In which Pierre Kim McDonald says, I would buy my benefits from Rick. Yeah. I can have if she needed them, she would. You have to listen all the way to the end. <laughs> nice. Well, Rick, it's been an absolute slice having you. Um, I know I'll see you again tomorrow morning. Oh, no, we won't. It's Good Friday, but normally we walk the kids to school school together. Uh, Rick is also my neighbor, and his dog leads our our local pack of children and parents to the school (laughs) every morning. So um, I guess happy Easter to all of you, and thanks so much for being our guest today. All right. Thank you for the invitation. It was really fun. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. All right. <laughs> Any information in this video is general information only and is not, nor is it intended to be, legal advice. Watching this video does not create a lawyer-client relationship. You should always seek the advice of a lawyer or other qualified professional for advice regarding your individual situation. While we take care to ensure that the information contained in this video is accurate and up-to-date, we make no warranties or representations as to the suitability, completeness, or accuracy of the information contained in this video. Any reliance you place on the information is at your own risk. Kahane Law Office, Merrick Law, Heather Mallory Professional Corporation, Evan Clark Professional Corporation, Evan Clark, Heather Mallory, and any guests will not be responsible nor liable in any way for any content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in the content, or for any loss or damage of any kind incurred as a result of any content communicated in this video, whether by Evan Clark, Heather Malarick, or by a third party. Kim McDonald is a financial advisor with Raymond James Limited. Information provided is not a solicitation, and although obtained from sources considered reliable, is not guaranteed. The view and opinions contained in this media are those of Kim McDonald, not Raymond James Limited. Securities-related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors, and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax-related matters. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, RJFE, a subsidiary of Raymond James Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. When providing life insurance products, financial advisors are acting as insurance representatives of RJFP. Darkness of the dales dissipates, declines because of he who turned water.